Good day, everyone. I'm Dr. John Ward, Director of the Coalition for Global Hepatitis Elimination at the Task Force for Global Health here in the United States. It's my pleasure to welcome you to our ongoing uh, webinar series with the National Institutes of Health. Eric's, we're exploring um, the NIH research related to advancing progress toward hepatitis elimination through improvements in prevention, testing, linkage to care, and treatment. Today, we'll be um, collaborating with our uh, colleagues at the National Institute on Drug Abuse, NIDA. We'll be looking at hepatitis C in the context of drug use, state-of-the-art diagnostic and uh, studies of pathogenesis that um, uh, will be um, helpful uh, as we look at uh, ways of eliminating hepatitis C. Um, uh, this is um, a part of a, as I mentioned, of an ongoing webinar series uh, that we um, have at the um, uh, Coalition for Global Hepatitis Elimination. Th this and the other webinars are available on our website at globalhep.org. So everything that you'll be seeing today will be available later on, on our website uh, as a full-length video, as individual videos uh, for the individual presentations and in their slide uh, presentations. We also uh, typically uh, develop a, a summary so that uh, people um, who are viewing the presentations later uh, can recognize what was, um, what was uh, presented and discussed so they can zero in on that particular part of the video um, presentation. Um, uh, we, this is about uh, the, uh, uh, we've had several uh, webinars from NIH uh, with NIH prior. Uh, they're listed here. As I mentioned, they're already up on our website at globalhep.org. Uh, um, and these are, let's see here. Next slide. Uh, you know, I do want to thank um, Nora Vocal, the director of NIDA, for um, stimulating the development of this webinar series really giving people uh, equal access to uh, understanding what research NIDA is conducting related to um, the prevention and um, cure of hepatitis C, particularly among people who inject drugs, as you'll be hearing more about from my uh, colleague, Dr. Wilson Compton, who's the deputy director of NIDA, followed by Dr. Raul Mandler, who's the senior physician, clinical medicine branch, division of therapeutics, medical consequences. Uh, at NIDA. So I'll turn it over to Wilson at this point. Uh, Wilson. Thank you very much, John. It's a pleasure to be here today on behalf of the National Institute on Drug Abuse to be speaking about a topic of, of, of great public health importance and one with great opportunities for major progress. And that's really the message that I hope I'll convey both directly and indirectly is that we have a unique opportunity at this point to address particularly hepatitis C, with the potential for elimination of this, what has been a scourge and a major killer uh, of populations, both in the US and internationally. Now, I wanna frame, I'm gonna frame a little bit of our research here, but, but remember that mine are just an introductory comments before we get to the main part of the seminar today uh, in a few minutes. As, I, as, as we think about the issues related to hepatitis C, it's important to recognize that it's not all by itself but hepatitis C is part of a constellation of intersecting epidemics or syndemics. And in particular, we think about how they overlap with HIV infection, with opioid dependence, fundamentally because of the high risk behavior that occurs when injection equipment is shared among individuals using, using drugs intravenously or by other forms of injection. Recent estimates have reminded us that this is not a small problem in the U.S. with some 3.7 million injection drug users in the U.S. Uh, in the most recent estimates. And there certainly is a classic example of how this synergy came together in terms of the outbreak in Indiana in 2015, where because of uh, intense injection of oxymorphone uh, 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 prescription opioids, we saw an outbreak of HIV and hepatitis C in a small rural county in southern Indiana. Now, I have some more recent data uh, from one of my colleagues, Dr. Stephanie Strathy and colleagues, uh, that helps illustrate how these crises come together, how these issues come together. 
So to look at this, I need to step back and look at the tra trajectory of our U.S. overdose crisis. Certainly for the last 20 years, this has uh, focused on opioids. First, the prescription opioids, like the oxymorphone uh, outbreak that I highlighted for you just a moment ago, heroin following shortly on its heels, and then most recently for about the last decade, synthetic opioids. That means fentanyl and the high potency fentanyl compounds that have produced such devastation in communities all across the country. Simultaneous with the emphasis on the synthetic opioids, that is fentanyl, we've seen a market increase in the incidence of H hepatitis C. Well, that's a curious juxtaposition in terms of the timing. For the first time in a paper that's now in a preprint form at uh, Clinical Infectious Diseases, Dr. Strathy and colleagues uh, 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 led by Joe Friedman uh, 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 have shown in their cohort at the Tijuana uh, 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 San Diego border that use of fentanyl is independently associated with HCV seroconversion in both the univariate and multivariate model. So this is an important example of how these two factors may be related to one another as part of this syndemic. And one way that one of my colleagues helped summarize this, and it's a, a, a reflection of the language in the paper, is that the short half-life of fentanyl plus the long half-life of hepatitis really uh, a, a, a leads to a dreadful combination. So this is important new data that I highlight for you coming from a, a NIDA-funded study primarily designed to address HIV, but clearly addressing the syndemic related to these multiple uh, public health issues. In general, NIDA is one of the largest funders of hepatitis C research at NIH with about $25 million in research in fiscal year 2023, the most recent full year we have with areas of research spanning multiple domains. I'm only gonna highlight a couple of these just to give you a taste for the kind of research we're supporting. But I thought I'd start out with some very important work coming from the Stanford Prevention Policy Modeling Lab. Doug Owens, Margaret Brando, uh, uh, Josh Solomon at Stanford, but also joined by Dave Peltiel, Greg Gonsalves at Yale, and Jim Kahn at UCSF. This group has helped us really explain how hepatitis, how screening for hepatitis C virus is a key first step in addressing this, this uh, crisis. It's effective and cost effective and is now part of the U.S. Preventative Services Task Force recommendations in 2020. I will say that that's when uh, Dr. Owens was the chair of the USPSTF. And so it's wonderful to see that his work uh, has led to major guideline changes by the U.S. Preventative Services Task Force. More recent work is focusing on how interventions that address these syndemics, hepatitis C, opioid use, and HIV simultaneously, might address the overall crisis for us. A second set of studies I want to highlight for you would, would, are what we call our Rural Opioid Initiative. This is a, a partnership between CDC, SAMHSA, and the Appalachian Regional Commission to conduct research studies to address the relationship of opioid use, HIV, and hepatitis C infection. These projects included both observational studies and the beginning of demonstration products or interventions. And they first helped us understand that uh, HCV testing uh, uh, is, is a key component of, of addressing this issue, but HIV, HCV testing was really not being done on a widespread basis. So there's a real need for expanding access to care. The observational data has already led to changes in terms of reimbursement in multiple states. So those are some of the very practical solutions in addition to the laboratory uh, at uh, uh, MGH, MIT at Harvard, the Ragon uh, Institute, Reagan Institute has been able to develop new technologies for doing phylogenetic linkages across uh, exposures to HCV. I'm very pleased that a follow-up funding opportunity is currently underway. Grants have been submitted and they're under review for this follow-up. So stay tuned for additional research to be conducted in rural populations all across the country supported by NIDA and our partners. Now, a third area that I want to highlight is our partnership with CDC's HIV Behaviors, Behavioral Surveillance uh, Program. 
that we were able to supplement this project to allow full testing for HCV in, in, this, in uh, the, the, the study conducted in 2018. This paper was just published this year, and it showed overall over 60% of the injection drug users were HCV antibody positive, and over 40% had current HCV infection. Really a remarkable example of the needs for outreach and intervention for these high-risk populations. As you can see from the graphic, it reminds us that, in, that the HCV infection occurs early in use of injection drugs. So within a year, almost all of the uh, 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 exposure to HCV had already been documented. Now, the last study I wanna highlight uh, is an intervention study. So we take that information about high-risk populations, in this case, a rural population in Kentucky. We couple that with the need to do aggressive outreach for injection drug users. And uh, Jennifer Havens and colleagues have been doing just such a study to test the possibility of eliminating hepatitis C in a population that had a large number of endemic uh, uh, high-risk uh, uh, in uh, 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 high risk behaviors and a high rate of hepatitis C. The, the key issue here is that they've been doing both on site testing using a rapid testing protocol and the, uh, 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 let me go back one, uh, the expert HCV finger stick and uh, RNA testing on site. So if in one hour they could determine the presence of hepatitis C antigens. And then for those who are positive, they generally started them on uh, the curative, potentially curative treatment, uh, Epclusa, for 12 weeks. What they've been able to show in their study of about 380 persons is that there's a sustained virological response in some 95%. There is reinfection in some, but it's so far it's a small number. In addition to doing these primary outcomes, this study was able to be uh, used in a very cost-effective way to help the Cepheid company uh, submit data to the uh, uh, Food and Drug Administration that allowed FDA to authorize the expert point-of-care device just now a little over a month ago, or about a month ago. So this is a way that NIDA has been supporting research across a range of areas related to hepatitis C. And we look forward to a more high impact research going forward. Now, I'm really pleased to turn it over now to Dr. Raul Mandler, who will introduce our speakers as we turn to the main events for today, which is Dr. Jackie Linus, who will be speaking to us about expansion of point of use acute HIV infection platforms for hepatitis C and Dr. Andrea Kovacs will be talking about long-term effects of, of injection drug use, HIV and HCV, and the impact of HCV cure uh, uh, among women. And finally, Dr. Andrea Cox will help lead discussion, but I encourage all of you who are listening to put your questions in the chat so we can have a lively discussion when these uh, uh, important uh, lectures are done. And with that, Dr. Mandlora, turn it over to you. Thank you, Wilson, for such a illustrative, uh, didactic, and enlightening presentation uh, that, you, that you gave us, usually give. And uh, I'd like to introduce first, uh, first of all, uh, we have a, a substantial portfolio in our, uh, in NIDA, like uh, Wilson said, uh, uh, in the clinical medical branch of a division of therapeutic and medical consequences, we have several important grants on HIV and hepatitis C. And I'm pleased to uh, have Dr. Linz and Dr. Kovacs, who are grantees with us. Dr. Linz has a DP2 a prestigious Avenir Award for HIV, and she's extending her studies on hepatitis C. Dr. Linz is a Marta Gross Associate Professor in uh, Purdue University and she has a PhD in bioengineering and graduate certificate in global health. She has a work on developing uh, special techniques on point of care diagnosis uh, for underserved populations. She not only cares for the te technical part of the, of the strategies, but also for the population studies, trying to implement 
uh, those techniques in the underserved population. Uh, with that, I'd like uh, Dr. Lins to uh, go ahead and present her seminar. Thank you so Jackie. much. Yeah. Really uh, appreciate the opportunity to be here today. And as I get slides up and running, um, want to talk a little bit about our, our transition and expansion of our work from HIV infection detection to hepatitis C virus detection. Um, with much thanks to Raul and, and to Nida for supporting these efforts. So uh, we know that the um, hepatitis C elimination is feasible in the United States. And I'm, I'm leaving it to Drs. Uh, Florence and Collins who uh, have a, a great discussion about this opportunity. And um, from them, one of the biggest problems is in testing and that it's not available in every community and that that testing requires multiple steps before a treatment can start. And so some of the solutions proposed are to expand testing locations so that we can increase access and to use new point of care tests to allow for rapid testing and treatment. And that's the area that we've been focusing on. We started focusing on this for HIV because um, the US and the world are not on target to meet the 95-95 goals for HIV and uh, awareness of uh, infection status is one of the biggest bottlenecks followed by getting people aware um, to be in care and to on uh, onto uh, antivirals and then um, of those individuals reaching viral suppression. Uh, so starting at that first step, uh, we've been thinking about this, how do we get more people in care? And it really is um, deploying new testing strategies and reaching people where they are. So um, healthcare access points uh, include hospitals, clinics, and uh, really getting out into the community. And so we've been targeting that, those community locations, uh, reaching people um, at uh, harm reduction sites, syringe service programs, uh, and people experiencing homelessness, um, high-risk populations that don't otherwise have easy access to uh, other um, healthcare points. And when we do that, and with any uh, diagnostic, we really have to consider what is the accuracy, the affordability, and the accessibility of these technologies. Uh, right now, the most accessible technology you can find is a lateral flow test, uh, also known as rapid diagnostic tests. You probably used one for COVID at one point. They're um, so available that the U.S. government's able to send them to mailboxes throughout the country. Uh, what you may not know is how they uh, run. And uh, in the case of HIV and, and hepatitis C, it's a finger stick of blood that contains a little bit of virus but mostly the antibodies that your body has produced against them flows onto the strip. Those bind to gold nanoparticles that uh, have other detection antibodies against them. They continue downstream to the test line where you see uh, that development. It's the gold piling up, followed by a control line for any extra uh, nanoparticles. And then uh, you're able to tell very simply two lines yes, one line no. Uh, whether there's been a uh, positive or negative response. So these uh, do exist for hepatitis C and for HIV. The question would be, why not just use those? And uh, the answer is because uh, the current uh, testing process and uh, how long it takes your body to produce antibodies. Right now, the CDC recommended testing sequence uh, for identifying current HCV infections is to do one of those antibody tests. If it's non-reactive, you can stop, but I'll come back to the little star. Um, if it is reactive, then you go to look at the viral RNA um, for a current infection. If that's not detected, then you can um, continue uh, following up as appropriate. If it is detected, then uh, you are linked to care. But if you go back to the little stop sign on the left, uh, if you've been exposed in the last six months, then you are still recommended for HIV RNA testing. So there's a it becomes a second step uh, and then follow up testing with antibodies uh, if RNA is not available. And that's because uh, 
despite getting infected, uh, most people within that first year, it takes almost six months, um, three to six months for antibodies in your body to develop. So the virus is growing in there and producing uh, RNA and, and a little bit of antigen available in the blood uh, from the surface of the virus. Uh, but all during that time, you haven't produced enough antibodies to um, respond. So, whoops, sorry. Uh, this, uh, this is during the seroconversion period, the antibodies are produced. And then in the case of HCV, you can actually clear the virus in some cases, but those antibodies are continued to be produced for years, uh, whereas the RNA and those antigens are gone when you're no longer infected. And so if we could detect that earlier stage when you're actually infected, that would be of benefit. Uh, however, at this point, we're a bit, uh, we either have uh, affordable and accessible, but not as accurate antibody-based rapid diagnostic tests, uh, or accurate, but not as affordable um, and less accessible RNA tests. However, I'm, I'm putting the Cepheid gene expert here because that um, being that very first approved HCV um, near patient test where this could be in clinics, um, it's about a little bit bigger than the size of a toaster. So it's not necessarily gonna be easy to get out uh, to where we're thinking of, but it does bring things much more close to access. Um, that said, there's a global need for accurate, affordable, and accessible uh, acute HIV and HCV diagnostics that uh, we are targeting. And so our goal is to combine that accessibility and affordability of paper-based rapid tests with the accuracy of those nucleic acid diagnostic tests and um, really target the virus and the viral RNA itself. The way we've been uh, thinking through this process has been a, a test that the blood lands on, just like your rapid test, and then goes through different processes for lysis of the virus to open it up available for nucleic acids, um, RNA amplification, and then detection on a readout that's the lateral flow test readout. Uh, and we have developed these little wax valves that help to move the process along from point to point without the user having to do a lot of additional um, steps. Uh, the conflict of interest that I have is that I am a co-founder of a company, Evertrue, that is working to commercialize this platform. All of the research that I'm presenting so far is, is from my academic lab, though. So back in uh, 2019, we had come up with this concept for uh, MicroRAD, Micro Rapid Autonomous Analytical Device. It was going to do everything from sample to answer. And uh, we're getting there. So we uh, were able to develop this using uh, nucleic acid amplification that is loop-mediated isothermal amplification, or LAMP. Uh, it uses a, a crude sample. You can put whole blood in if you dilute it a little bit. It needs a heater to get to 60 to 68 degrees and a timer, but it doesn't need a lot of instrumentation the way PCR does to, to cycle temperatures. You can hold it at that temperature for 25 to 60 minutes, and it goes through this um, biological process in the background where it becomes uh, producing billions of copies of uh, your target. And you'll notice the little star in the circle, and uh, those are tags on the primers that you've designed against this. And those can be read on a lateral flow test, which makes it a very simple uh, two lines yes, one line no readout that uh, folks are familiar with. The, the fluidic control that we use, these little wax valves um, were the sort of secret sauce to, to move things along, as I mentioned. And when we're done, this device looks um, like this image here. And so your sample goes on the white pad, the uh, buffer in the green, and when we amplify it for 60 minutes, um, this is sped up 150 times uh, so that we can not watch it for the whole video. Uh, everything is making its um, nucleic acid amplicons, and then these valves are heated to 80 degrees C, and everything, all the liquid gets pushed downstream for the uh, lateral flow readout, which you can analyze. Uh, we waited conservatively for a full 90 minutes, but you can do that in, in less time. For your user, uh, add uh, sample, add buffer, close it up, heat. Uh, it automatically heats with the electronics inside, those uh, run for their cycle of 30 to 90 minutes and then um, automatically gets to the readout. 
And we really thought this was an elegant way to demonstrate that we could detect HIV from whole blood uh, with positive and negative samples. When we started this, uh, we wanted to increase the limit of detection to make it more sensitive, which we're still working on, uh, but we've got a start. Um, now, as we were thinking about this from a very technology-centric perspective, uh, we started talking with our public health collaborators about, well, you know, would an hour-long test be competitive compared to a, a one-minute or 20-minute antibody test? Uh, and so we've really started refining our process for um, doing this by using stakeholder-informed feasibility and accessibility iterative device design, and then um, training community health workers uh, so that they can help us design uh, and evaluate usability tests. This uh, community and stakeholder engagement in the engineering design process is essential. We teach it to all of our undergraduate students, and it's often ignored uh, when professionals are, are doing this ourselves. Uh, so uh, this successful ad uptake and adoption of these technological innovations requires understanding of the need and the context that these are being implemented in, um, for. So not just the end user who's using it, but also anybody else who's impacted becomes an important stakeholder. Uh, and we always recommend you know, engaging and listening to all of those stakeholders. We uh, can't always do that ourselves, so we collaborate with the Health Tequity Lab at Purdue University, led by Dr. Natalia Rodriguez, and um, you use their expertise to help train uh, researchers in my lab and uh, help them to learn how to go out and ask the right kinds of questions. And so engaging diverse stakeholders in identifying key requirements uh, is something that we're, we've learned how to do from them. The uh, those stakeholders that we've worked with so far include healthcare providers that we've done interviews and focus groups with, patients, uh, and community health workers and community leaders. Less formally, um, we've gone out and talked to policymakers, manufacturers, and distributors, and, and other payers for the technology to understand their perspectives as well. But uh, I want to share with you uh, some of the work uh, that Dr. Rodriguez led in that um, evaluation in designing an HIV diagnostic. We started doing this in 2020, so there were some complications, uh, but we learned a lot from innovations from COVID uh, as well. Uh, using the socioecological model to guide the process, we had uh, 15 interviews of HIV and AIDS service organizations around Indiana. And uh, really the central question was, uh, would this be a feasible test and what is happening right now? So currently blood is sent out to central laboratories for testing, but uh, overall the response was that yes, it would be worth a one hour point of care HIV test. Um, th thoughts from various individuals uh, that could detect uh, a month or so earlier than regular antibody tests uh, because we can detect the virus uh, RNA were that, um, yes, it, it would be feasible. So reducing HIV transmission, a lot of people share needles and the sooner you know that you're positive, the sooner you can stop exposing other people, obviously keep it contained and that's really important from um, one of the clients of the organizations. Another uh, client said that I think there is a need because the sooner you know about it, the sooner you can start treatment and start uh, trying to keep it from getting worse. So there's very much an, an interest from the beneficiaries of the technology. We also wanted to find out whether this would be uh, better implemented as a self-test or if um, someone going into the community, like a community health worker or peer recovery specialist, uh, would be better leading the testing. Uh, so again, we, we went and had more um, summary structured qualitative interviews with HIV service organizations and their clients. Um, found that some of the benefits of at-home testing were uh, access and convenience and privacy, peace of mind, concerns uh, were also accuracy, um, uh, usability, uh, interpretation, self-reporting, lack of a path to follow up, um, similar to the lack of counseling, and potentially increasing the stigma because uh, it was thought that if you have to do it in the privacy of your own home, it might not be um, it, it might be further implying that it was something to be ashamed of. Uh, some of the 
really interesting discussion points that were had. Uh, a client thought that in the terms of privacy, I think it'd be cool to be able to do it yourself. A lot of times I feel like some people might have a sliver of doubt where, you know, if they did something, if something did happen, maybe they would just want to be able to test themselves in private. On the flip side, a uh, concern expressed um, by providers was uh, self-reporting. If I'm self-testing, you're home alone, you know, I'm going to, am I going to report myself if it does come out reactive uh, from a counseling and testing program manager? So what is the path to follow up? Similarly, um, on that peace of mind, uh, I can be by myself. And if I imagine or wonder or have any issues or whatever, then it's easy to do. And, you know, I, I go on from there. Like I said, at least I know I'm good on my end. So that the value of having a negative result um, was another uh, client consideration. The concerns on the positive result, uh, if if a person turned out positive, they're there on their own in that moment, and that would be a traumatic moment. You don't test yourself for cancer and find out all alone that you have cancer. So that would be dramatic. And I think that's a, a really valid um, consideration uh, that our, our clients are bringing up here. Uh, and the community health worker and peer-led testing, uh, many of the same benefits, access, someone who's skilled at building trust, but a lot of focus on that, that um, human element that having somebody there with you is able to bring. So educating and supporting, bonding through shared experiences for peer-led testing, uh, and having a safe, non-judgmental space. Concerns being that you're limited by budget and institutional policies and capacity, uh, gaining trust with the individuals and the emotional well-being of the um, testers themselves. So one of the the aspects um, that we were considering financially, but not policy-wise, uh, was brought up. We're limited by our budget and limited by what we can, as an institution, can do. We used to go to the jails, and then they changed the rules, so now we can't. Uh, and so thinking about, I'm very aware that technology is not going to solve any problems on its own, but working within the context of the outreach coordinators and testers and community health workers that are really doing the work um, and seeing where this can be implemented. So key considerations that we saw, ensuring accuracy, considering the cost, cost to the clients and the organizations that are delivering these, creating um, a test that is simple. Um, before I go too far, uh, one client said, as long as I can trust the accuracy and all, uh, yeah, can you know, why not get tested, which is is great to hear. Um, another, um, create a test that's simple and simple instructions. As long as the instructions clear everything, that would be fine. Also, what to do if you test positive and that emotional support and counseling for self-testing. Um, noting that mm, these are all very important considerations and our concerns that we have even for self-testing today with uh, HIV and HCV antibody tests that are available. So thinking through these, uh, we're going back to our, our process and iterating on our device design. Right now, uh, we have a sample um, control to improve the interpretation accuracy so that you know uh, and can be confident that your test functions the way uh, you expect it to. So here we've added a third line, which may make it a little more complicated, which is why we're gonna go back and work with the community and ask them. But we have our, our control flow that makes sure everything got there, but also this 18S rRNA human amplification control that ensures that you have enough sample and that the chemistries are still functioning properly so that the reaction can amplify. So both of those should always be there. And then the test line, in this case, looking at SARS-CoV-2, uh, will only be there when you have uh, um, antigen, or if you have the RNA of interest. So at zero, you only have two lines. Everywhere else, you have three lines. So in, in this case, we'd have to change it from um, to two lines, yes, three or two lines, no, three lines, yes, and one line would be a test failure. Um, so there would be a little more um, engagement and, and training, as even I have to uh, describe it correctly. But we think that that uh, is reasonable and that people will be able to count to three and be able to do the test that way. After that, we're um, going back to um, community health worker training for usability studies, getting feedback, 
uh, and working on this process for your hepatitis C specifically to find out what are the concerns um, that individuals have with that. Uh, the other thing that we're trying to do is simplify the device to reduce the cost. So we know that number of parts is one of the expenses. So we've taken this from 14 parts down to just six components. And um, we expect that that is going to be much uh, lower cost and uh, further in order to prove that and demonstrate it to ourselves, we made our own little um, low cost assembly setup so that we can see just how many steps it takes to put everything together. Uh, and here you can see the little redesigned uh, parts and we put the wax valve on the lateral flow test uh, and the amplification area so that we can um, try these out ourselves. So in conclusion, uh, we're modeling a human-centered approach to health technology design. Uh, we've got evidence of acceptability and the benefits of acute HIV testing that I hope will apply to HCV, and uh, context-specific considerations to improve the design and facilitate adoption of the devices. Next up, uh, we're going to do this specifically for HCV design specifications. We have our IRB approved and ready to go. And uh, we're acquiring iterative feedback from the HCV stakeholders on the usability and feasibility in intended settings. And we want to continue engaging broader stakeholder groups, uh, people who aren't yet in care, uh, payers, manufacturers, in the process of device development, with the goal that we can get accurate, accessible HIV and HCV testing for the whole community. Um, thanks to everybody in my lab that has contributed to this collaborators, particularly the Health Tequity Lab and our Indiana HIV aid organizations and clients, uh, and our funding sources from um, NIDA and uh, the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation that uh, particularly helped us with this stage of uh, involvement in the design and scale up for HIV and HCV. With that, thank you all very much. Thank you, Jackie. I'm, I'm very impressed by the fact that you are a leader in not leaving your discoveries in the ivory tower, but your feedback and application of your discoveries into the community means, means a lot, means a lot to, to, to the world, essentially. So hopefully you will continue making progress with your grants and with your discoveries and uh, implementation of your techniques. Uh, I think we will leave the questions for the discussion that will be uh, uh, moderated by uh, John Ward and Dr. Cox. Uh, and so we can present now Dr. Uh, Andrea Kovacs. Uh, Andrea uh, has been working, is, is, is working uh, her career uh, is essentially uh, uh, a model career on uh, from the times of the discovery of uh, the HIV here in the United States and continues uh, with uh, her virology and uh, 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 discoveries, particularly with application or with uh, in, in minority uh, populations, including women, children, pregnant women. Uh, she is the professor of pediatrics, pathology, and laboratory medicine at University of Southern California, uh, and has dedicated all the time to uh, the underserved populations using innovative strategies, multidisciplinary care, and uh, now focusing on uh, not only on HIV, in HIV, but on also on HCV. Uh, so uh, with that said, uh, Andrea, all yours. Great. Uh, so, um, screen one. I'm going to just set it up right now. So, just give me one second. Um, I'm honored to be asked to speak at this wet webinar. I've spent my whole career on pathogenesis studies of HIV and cold viral infections. So, HCV. Infection is a curable infection. Even HIV, even in HIV co-infected individuals, and yet access is limited worldwide. What I'm going to do at first is I'm going to do a quick overview of the epidemiology, 
And then I will discuss some of our published work <clears throat> that leads into our work on the uh, impact of HCV cure on immune activation of liver fibrosis. Worldwide, there are about 50 to 70 million people who have chronic hepatitis C with up, up to a million new infections yearly. But as of 19, uh, 2022, only about 36% of the people worldwide know their diagnosis. In the US, there's about 2.7 to 3.9 million people infected chronically with hepatitis C. There are 2.3 million estimated worldwide, uh, according to the CDC, and half of these are infected through injection drug use. Despite the availability of curable DAAs, however, only about 20% or 12.5 million people have been treated with DAAs by the end of 2022. And um, this figure here kind of shows you where the highest percentage of is our uh, viremic infection. And you can see Russia is one of the big places. Now, another important group of people are women of childbearing age. And this is a modeling study um, published recently. And it's estimated that almost 15 million women of childbearing age are infected with hepatitis C. And of these, almost 30,000 have been pregnant with a five to 15% uh, estimated mother-to-child transmission rates. And of these, 3.5% have chronic hepatitis C. The figure shows the prevalence of HCV worldwide in childbearing women. And you can see again, the areas that are most infected uh, are, you know, the Southeast Asia and Russia. <clears throat> So the studies I'm going to present right now of HIV and HCV are, are nested within the Women's Interagency HIV Study. It's now called the MaxWise Combined Cohort Study. Um, the advantage is it's a, it's a prospective study. Samples are collected, history is taken, uh, physicals are done. Uh, the study started in 1994, so you can have a uh, prospective and retrospective samples to answer specific research questions. So the research questions that we're focusing on include what are the long-term consequences of HIV, HCV co-infection on immune, immunopathogenesis and disease outcome, specifically AIDS and fibrosis of the liver. Then the question is, well, what if both viruses are treated? So there is no longer viremia. How does that change things? How does that impact liver fibrosis? Um, but there are many complicating factors. For one thing, people are aging through a cohort like this. Women go into menopause. And um, it's important to determine what happens after a DAA treatment and the effect of all these factors such as aging and menopause. So this is essentially our hypothesis. The figure demonstrates our hypothesis relating to pathogenesis of co-infection. Um, immune activation and dysregulation are driven by the viremia of these two viruses. Um, I'm gonna use the laser pointer. So uh, HIV viremia, HCV viremia, <clears throat> leading to um, risk of AIDS and liver disease. Now ongoing immune, uh, IGU amplifies this action, activation because injection uh, drugs are, are highly activating and also impact the liver. Now, additionally, aging and menopause increase immune dysfunction. The figure on the right is, uh, has, is a little bit more mechanistic it's very complicated and I won't go through it, but in a set, essentially the two viruses act together to cause activation, T cell senescence, T cell exhaustion, changes in the maturation of T cells, activation of monocytes, and then all these cytokines that are um, promote 
chronic liver fibrosis. So now we look at um, what are the consequences, the clinical consequences of the impact of co-infection and pathogenesis of disease. If untreated, co-infection impacts the innate adapt adaptive mood immunity leading to CD4 depletion, importantly, CD8 T cell exhaustion, and then as a result, AIDS, HANA diseases, such as cardiovascular disease and liver disease, especially, this especially occurs more rapidly if there is hepatitis C co-infection. So I, I'm next gonna focus on how does, how does what is the mechanism uh, of this rapid progression. Um, there are many studies that have looked at uh, disease progression when you have HIV, HCV together. This is an older study that we uh, published, but it's very relevant into the, as we move on to look at the impact of cure. So how does HCV and HIV disease progression, what is, how, how does that, what are the mechanisms that, that cause this progression? So we looked at this, um, and in this, in this, um, in this uh, slide, you can see that the Kaplan-Myers show the probability of being AIDS-free, or of dying, or being, um, or remain AIDS-free if if they never had a CD4 count less than 200. So this is. AIDS-free for all. This is for those. This is the, those who die, and this is those that um, never had a CD4 below 200. The blue line includes HIV positive only women, while the other lines show the risk of AIDS by HCD RNA level. And as you can see, the higher the HCD RNA level down here is the highest, um, the higher is the risk of AIDS and death. Here, the depth is that it actually, it's the very high, highest level, which is you know, over three or four million copies, um, is uh, predictive of AIDS. And then here, you still see that the HIV only doing better. This kind of tells you that treatment may be very, very important in co-infected people. HCV. So here we show you the association of CD4 and CD8 activation with HCV viral load. So now we're going one step further. How does this affect the, uh, the activation? What is the mechanism? And you can see here in multivariate model, models that the actually those who are um, have the highest level have higher uh, activation levels than those who are HIV only infected. Same with HCV, uh, same with uh, CD4 cells. Um, as shown in the slide, um, in the upper panel, I just reviewed, and then in the, in the lower panel, you'll see that there's a threefold increased risk of developing AIDS and dying when comparing the women with the highest level of activation with those with the lowest level of activation in multiple models adjusting for viral load, CD4, CD4 and viral load. But here it's, it's extremely, you know, that's, that, that tells us that this is a, probably one of the mechanisms that is the cause of disease progression. Because once you get CD8 activation, the T cells become, the CD8 cells become energetic. So the summary, HC, HIV, HCV viremic women had significant, significantly higher present, percentages of activated CD8 T cells than HIV only infected. And this is associated with higher incidence of AIDS related illness or death. We then went, went one step further to assess if T cell activation is related to HLA genes. This study evaluates the link between HLA and T cell activation as a potential causal pathway leading to HIV, HCV disease. We know H and I've shown that T cell activation increases um, AIDS diagnosis, AIDS, AIDS outcome, 
HLA has been shown to, uh, uh, to affect disease progression. So we looked at this in relation to activation. As you can see in this, um, uh, these two, uh, this slide and these two panels, we show the relationship between CD8 and CD4 activation and significant AHLA alleles in multivariate models. The two important alleles that I put the arrows, you can see these here, um, are associated with higher, so P1801 is associated with a very increased CD4 and CD8 activation compared to uh, those with the allele compared to those without the allele. And then the B5703 has significantly lower levels of activation. And you can see this in this next slide um, where the betas, which is, is the decrease or increase. And here B1801 shows an increase a mean increase in the activation level, CD8 activation levels, uh, among those with the allele versus without the allele. Similarly, the B5703 shows decreased um, active CD8 activation levels. So inclusion for this particular study, we found 10 HLA alleles that were associated with both CD8 and CD4 activation. When an allele was associated with both, the direction of activation was the same, which is, you know, which is, uh, makes sense. These findings suggest that a person's HLA allele type may play a role in modulating T cell activation independent of viral load and sheds light on the relationship between host HLA, T cell activation, immune control, and HIV pathogenesis. We next turn to how, how the, to look at the impact of HIV HCV co-infection on liver disease. Um, it's well known that HIV uh, patients who are co-infected with HCV have accelerated progression of liver fibrosis. The liver is obviously an incredibly important organ in modu modulate CD8 T cell activation and destruction of activated CD8 T cells. Activated CD8 T cells that traverse the liver may induce activation of stellate cells and Kufner cells leading to apoptosis and fibrosis. But there are many factors that impact fibrosis. There are HIV related, HCV related and host related. And all of these need to be in consideration as you do studies, uh, epidemiologic uh, studies of the pathogenesis of liver disease progression. And that's why our studies that I'm presenting are teasing this out. And here, this is the same cartoon, same diagram, um, looking at all the factors that, and I won't go into it, but it, is, it shows you how complex this is and you have to just tease it apart and focus on one area at a time to be able to, and then put it all together. So the impact of HCV cure on immune activation and liver fibrosis in aging women is um, the next topic. Well, the PIs are myself and Dr. Tian from UCSF and, R and, and this is funded by an R01 through NIDA. So the central hypothesis of this study, which builds on the information we learned from the other studies is that HCV cure with after HCV cure, co-infected women who are aging will have impaired liver fibrosis regression because of HIV-associated immune dysregulation and an increased risk of metabolic perturbations, including hepatic steatosis, fatty liver, for instance. Non, there's a non-alcoholic fatty liver uh, leading to non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. This is increased in co-infected um, patients and it increases with age and it increases as women go into menopause. And with residual and continued liver injury, there will be persistent immune activation dysregulation. So the studies that we're gonna, I'm gonna read next, a couple of, some of them, couple of them published, the rest are preliminary data, are all, all nested within the Women's Interagency HIV study. 
So the first thing uh, we uh, uh, that that I wanted to focus on is this is a longitudinal cohort study uh, where we assess the fibrosis progression across repro reproductive age using validated serum fibrosis markers, um, specifically um, APRI and FIB4. And what you can see here, and we use the anti-mullerian hormone as a, as a measure of reproductive ages. So this looks at, um, and this is done longitudinally and, um, and adjusted, uh, age adjusted, across reproductive age. And you can see that um, pre-menopause, it's, it's lower, but once you start reading, getting to in the perimenopausal period, there is increased fibrosis. And that's true both, you know, looking at, um, looking at FIB4 and APRI. And what I guess this is, what is new in this study is that, um, Fibrosis accelerates with a, a, a reproductive aging, but but what's new is that this accelerated fibrosis begins in this perinatal period, highlighting a previously unrecognized group of women at increased risk for advanced fibrosis and associated complications. So this is an important finding in that it um, it, um, it 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 it. it it explains some of the uh, what about our hypotheses about liver fibrosis progression and that aging and menopause together alters progression of liver and most likely this is due to I mean it is probably depleted to estrogen but there are many other factors that come into play. Um, this particular study uh, we published um, recently. And this looked at the longitudinal assessment of enhanced liver fibrosis score following DAA treatment. And you can see this looks at the trajectories. Um, we used enhanced liver fibrosis score, ALT, APRI, in 116 women with co-infection over four year period. There was a rise in serum biomarkers of liver fibrosis early on. So, we looked at one, one, one year before, one to two years before, one year after, uh, and then you know more than one year. And what is interesting is that followed by declines, there's an unexpected beginning, it's unexpected rise starting a year after treatment. So it's sort of like flattens off here. The flattening of declines over one to two years after treatment suggests that continued monitoring of liver fibrosis and interventions to mitigate its progression in people with HIV uh, is, is essential. So I think we need to be looking beyond one to two years. Now, now I'm gonna to turn to the unpublished studies and these are focusing again on, uh, we'll be focusing on the impact of T cell activation and non-invasive markers of liver fibrosis uh, among those with and without hepatitis. We will then look at alterations in various markers of activation after, after cure. And then we will also be looking at viral reservoirs. So in this study, um, the table of the results for the CD4 and CD activation markers that you see here um, uh, are evaluated in association with FIB4. So what you see is a, a, a clear cut um, increased fibrosis with CD4 activation, so threefold increase. There's a trend for a CD8 increase, but importantly, having resting T cells is protective. And that is um, interesting because it may have some impact on re viral reservoirs. 
So this particular study, I, I'm only giving you highlights because all of these studies are extremely complex and have many, you know, adjustments and, and very uh, detailed statistical analyses. But CD4 activation is associated with markers of liver fibrosis in co-infected women, independent of viral load. And these resting T cells, having high levels of resting T cells seem to be protective. That would mean there would be probably fewer activated T cells. Um, but, but the finding that CD4 positive T cells are increased uh, and cause increased activation, uh, this may impact HIV reservoirs, which is what we're interested in looking at. So here we look at first um, the impact of HCV cure on immune activation dysregulation and then HIV reservoirs. Uh, this is what the team that works with me on these studies. Um, we include 297 women, they are matched to HIV infected only women by age, gender, race, viral load, and visit. And all the patients that we studied had HIV viral load less than 200. So here we are, we're testing the hypotheses. We've got one virus where the patients are non-viremic, which is HIV. And now we're looking at the second virus, which is HIV. And we're looking at the impact of curing that virus and what does that do to liver virosis progression? What will that do to AIDS progression? And how does that impact all the immunologic markers that are have been found to be abnormal uh, with co-infection? So we've now, uh, this, is, this is preliminary data. We've now had um, studied and sample analyzed about uh, 218 uh, uh, PPMCs. Huge number of subcells are sorted, I'll go over that. And 92 women who, for whom we have two time points before and after DA, we are, uh, we are now analyzing this, this data. And these are the markers we're studying. So we did 13 color flow, and we are very interested in looking at, you know, maturational changes, you know, what happens to Tregs, we're looking at senescence, exhaustion. What we'll I'll present today will be mostly on the activation data. And, um, and we're also interested in monocytes and all these other markers. What happens after you cure HCV and you, you have your immune, uh, your, your viral HIV viral load is undetectable. So in this particular slide, um, we look at the impact of DA treatment on CD4 and CD act activation. And this is a small sample size, so you have to keep that in mind. But um, what it does show that there is a decline in activation levels from pre-DA treatment to post-DA treatment in some of these women. And it's mainly those that started off with high activation levels. Um, and that's true for CD8 and CD4 T cells. We also looked at Tregs, and you do see there's a decline in a group of women who's T, uh, who had high Tregs to, to more, you know, more standard Tregs. And um, you don't see that in the controls. Remember, every, we ran these samples together, and they're all matched, uh, except there is no HCV viremia or HCV co. There's no HCV viremia in this group, and there's no and the HIV RNA is undetectable in both groups. So this study shows the uh, preliminary data with a small sample of size, but it appears that following the AA treatment, both CD4 and CD activation seem to decrease after some um, treatment in some co-infected women. Similarly, see, we see changes in Tregs, but uh, we will not be able to get to the truth here really until we do a further analysis on a, the bigger sample size of 92 women and at multiple time points. 
So we now turn to measuring HIV reservoirs, which again, is this is our team who are studying HIV reservoirs. And um, first, um, I want to summarize a little bit about what we did here is the, the, we sorted on specific cells that we want to analyze um, not only for viral reservoirs, but also to look at um, gene signature expressions. And um, so we're planning those studies. Past studies have produced mixed results on how DNA mediate AHCB cure. Um, they focus mainly on CD4 cells and total HIV DNA. Our assays include two LTR to, to assess not only HIV DNA, but also the ratio of latent two LTR and, and total HIV DNA. We first looked at non-activated HLADR um, cells, which are the resting cells that represent um, the, you know, some, and, and the potential latent reservoirs. So this, I, I'm not going to go through this in great detail, but you can see from this, this is our methodology for DDPCR. This is what it looks like when you look at, uh, and then this is analyzed, and these little dots represent um, the, 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 the two LTR and the CCR5, which is our control. So first, you know, we, we sorted the seven populations and then extracted the DNA and then ran samples and replicates. And we focused on GAG, 2LTR and CCR5. And we had adjusted uh, for the uh, number of cells using CCR5. And so here you see small sample size, but there are six patients, three are uh, co-infected and three are mono-infected matched. The average of these here that the, the, the co-infected have higher gag before and after, but with a decrease, somewhat decrease is probably not statistical, but we won't know until we have much larger sample sizes. And two LTR before and after, and these are the HIV only. So I suspect that this will, we will be able to show this since we were able to definitely see a decrease in, um, in several of these patients, especially these two high ones. So in conclusion, uh, our studies from the, from the WISE um, and now the Max WISE combined cohort study um, have demonstrated that HCV infection has a major impact on immunopathogenesis of HIV and HCV disease. Very preliminary data suggests that with controlled HIV and HCV cure, there's improvement in activation and decrease in HIV reservoirs. These data suggests that access to DAA would have a major impact on the worldwide problem of HCV and HIV co-infections. So this should be, you know, looking at the diagnosis and then immediate treatment would have major impact. Lastly, I would like to thank a very special thanks to women and the wives who participated in these studies and our funding partners. Our studies were funded at first by NIDA and currently, I mean by NIAID and currently are being funded by NIDA. The Max Prize is funded by NHLBI is the major uh, agency that almost every other agency uh, is involved. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea. That was a, a very solid, very beautiful presentation. Um, I'm glad that you brought the WISE. This is a multi-institutional uh, project, uh, successful. And uh, uh, the timing is good to, stay, to study frailty. Frailty is, uh, is uh, popular now in all media, in all medicine. And so you are focusing on postmenopausal women that have had the infection. Uh, HIV, as we know, have become a chronic disorder. People live longer, but with the disease, they are vulnerable, vulnerable when they inject drugs. 
So this was a beautiful presentation. Thank you. And uh, uh, without pause, I'm going to bring uh, our discussant, uh, Dr. Andrea Cox, professor of uh, medicine at uh, Johns Hopkins University. Uh, she first uh, studied virology and has her PhD from Neighbor uh, University of Virginia. Uh, and uh, uh, now she's at Hopkins, where she is uh, specialized in viral hepatitis center. She's the member of the Division of Infectious Disorders. We are in between Virginia and uh, Baltimore. So uh, here at the NIH, we have supported her studies and she's going to discuss these uh, two papers and bring her views of uh, uh, current science. Go ahead, Andrea. Thank you so much for, for helping us. Thanks for the invitation to moderate and also for those two fantastic talks. Uh, maybe I'll start, uh, Jackie, you made the really important point that HCV antibodies are negative in the acute phase of infection and HCV RNA is critical for testing for acute infection. I want to just make another point, which is um, Dr. Compton pointed out that reinfection occurs in individuals who've been previously treated. Um, and, and we see people with positive antibodies who've spontaneously controlled HCV, as well as those who've been treated. So we've had a lot of misinformation imparted to patients based on a positive antibody test that doesn't reflect their current situation from an infection standpoint. And also um, HCV RNA is critical for monitoring for reinfection in individuals, um, including people who inject drugs who are at ongoing risk of HCV infection. So in addition to the time it takes to run the test, there's probably a cost barrier because otherwise I think, you know, HCV RNA testing, I would love to see us do away with HCV antibody testing and only test for HCV RNA, which is really what matters. So could you talk a little bit about Maybe the cost barrier as well, or other things that you think will limit uptake of the systems that test just for HCV RNA. Yeah, and the cost is very much a concern. I think that uh, right now, the even even the enzymes that do that nucleic acid amplification, they're not particularly cheap. Uh, and in comparison to buying antibodies, which is a really well established um, market that exists, so. There's certainly cost issues in the, the assay itself before you put the device packaging around it. And then um, we've been looking a lot at that packaging and um, the technologies that are using are doing that are, are mostly injection molding, which is just generally more expensive than, than roll to roll paper, which newspapers are printed on for really cheap. So bringing that cost down is gonna be uh, really critical to access. Well, I hope someone considers uh, sending patients to the doctor who are antibody positive and RNA negative and the cost of that and considering cost, as well as the psychological impact of telling someone who uh, thinks they're cured of hep C that they, they have hepatitis C virus infection, which I think shouldn't be underestimated. Yeah. That would be a great model to do. I can ask a question um, of Andrea as well. You mentioned the maternal or uh, or parent to child transmission of hepatitis C is is becoming increasingly a problem. Uh, I would I'm interested in your thoughts on uh, risk factors for that, particularly uh, the fact that people of childbearing age who are acutely infected in pregnancy they tend to have higher HCV RNA levels and low or no antibody levels. And if you think that's part of why we're we're seeing this rise and the the rise of maternal or paternal, uh, parental to child transmission that we're seeing? So, um, so it's um, transmission of hepatitis C and actually a lot of other viruses, but uh, are closely related to viral load. And the higher the viral, I didn't present that study, I had it by too many slides, <laughs> I cut, cut. Um, the, the viral load greater than 10 to the sex is closely associated with hepatitis C transmission, as is um, bleeding. So if you're anytime during pregnancy. And that's probably, I mean, uh, who knows, but it's probably, it could, it could be, um, there are, the virus can be all over the body, including the genital tract, and who knows 
but the mechanism, whether it transverses the placenta or it's ascending, uh, but those are the two major risk factors. I think if women are injecting during pregnancy repeatedly, you know, that's obviously gives you a chance for having, you know, increased uh, uh, chances of, of uh, transmitting. Yeah, I think given the higher HCV RNA levels in the acute phase and the absence of antibodies could be a risk factor. I'd love to see someone do a study to see if uh, acute infection is is resulting in more transmission. Yeah, that would be, it, it, we'd have to find the patients, but there are ongoing studies of treating in pregnancy, or there will be. Um, capturing acute infection in pregnancy is probably, you know, not often the Done. I mean, if you had, if you did universal testing worldwide, which is with, and you use the HIV model, where similarly, if you have high viral loads and you have acute infection, the, the transmission rate goes way up and the risk is extremely high. Um, yeah, that's. Yeah, I see I that uh, we, someone posted that HCV RNA testing is was approved Cepheids um, by the FTA, and I do think that represents a really important advance. Yeah, in the U.S., but you know, yeah. this is a worldwide problem. Most of the infections are not in the U.S. I mean, yes, we have a large population, but the rest of the world has you know fifty million, <laughs> uh, of which, as I showed you, there's quite a few pregnant women who deliver babies. There definitely seems like a role for policy in in implementing more of that universal testing and preventing uh, transmission and uh, just infection with with that treatment capabilities. Yeah, I mean, it, it, you know, mother, uh, that's an area I spent my, most of my career on is mother to child transmission, and and you know, it is a very complex issue because it it varies on what trimester and. Um, other factors in terms of age and, um, you know, whether you have C-section or they had, you know, how long is your rupture of memory? There's a lot of factors involved in mother to child transmission. But if you, if you use the model that we use for HIV in the rest of the world, meaning all pregnant women are tested and probably should be tested, you know, if they're negative multiple times, then that would allow, um, you to identify the women and maybe you know very soon we'll have some studies to demonstrate that it's it's okay to treat pregnant women early in pregnancy or throughout yeah pregnant women is the largest population with hepatitis c that are not recommended for treatment at the moment and uh, we need to correct that as you point that out you know typically it's about a three to five percent risk of transmission from mother to child with HIV increasing that, uh, as you as you pointed out, some of those other cofactors like ruptured membranes and and, and uh, duration of labor and, and uh, they, you know they're they're sort of weak uh, weak risk factors. Um, 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 uh, so I think the major point is is that we need to screen and treat. There's a few uh, studies going on as you mentioned already to uh, to. See how we can collect the data, mostly on the safety side, to show that these drugs right. are safe for mother and child. And we have a TIP Hep C, a, a global registry that we're doing with CDC to collect data when a patient, a pregnant woman, and the uh, clinician decide that they want to proceed with treatment. They can report the outcomes for the mother and the child. So just, just it's sort of a little bit of an advertisement for people that are uh, are aware of that uh, to come to our website and uh, learn more about TIP. Uh, hep C. Um, so in the United you. States, when we, you know, the epidemic started out, you had a lot more HIV, HCV co-infected pregnant women because IDU was very, you know, that was one of the major causes of transmission. Worldwide, I think it's very similar. Now, recently with these increases in IDU and, you know, snorting, which has blood and other ways that you can transmit, uh, women, again, looking at pregnant women, uh, it, you know, it's recommended that they get tested, but, uh, you know, through nine months, if someone's using drugs, 
you really need repeat testing. Yeah, advertising yeah. also just the importance of testing in pregnancy. This is in many cases the only contact young healthy individuals have with the healthcare system. And so it is an opportunity to test people who are otherwise not seeking medical care in any setting. Yeah. 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 And, and the other other benefit of treatment during pregnancy is probably Andrea Cox will mention is just how many women fall out of care after delivery. And so they don't get treated for their own health, uh, let alone uh, interrupting transmission to their infant. Right. I mean, what we're trying to do at our, at our site is pull the HCV positive women into our clinic, which is now a co-infected clinic, but also infectious disease clinic. And then the ACTG, it does have some clinical trials, one coming up soon for treating pregnant women. And, um, you know, I think they need to be in a, in, in, a, in a center where they can have the whole whole care, meaning not just treat them and let them go, but have ongoing contact because injection drug use is, you know, a chronic problem people go back they stop and they go back another question for you andrea you notice that there's activation state is uh decreasing with direct acting antivirals and and yet the percentage of hcv specific t cells in the later stages of infection is very very small so i'm curious to know what your hypothesis is about why there's so much less activation when you're probably not removing much hep C specific T cell activation from that picture. So you're talking about when they cleared the virus? At the last study you showed, you showed that with DAA treatment, you decreased activated T cells, which is good because you've shown that that right. can enhance progression to HIV, but from uh, in HIV to AIDS. I'm just curious if this is a, just a global activation state because the percentage of T cells specific for HCV is very small in chronic infection, particularly active T cells since they're mostly exhausted. So when you look at the numbers and we, you know, we're looking at this data right now, the 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 um, the activation levels overall in HIV are low now. You know, now that they've been. They're down, they're down to less than 200 over low. But with co-infected, as you saw what I showed, is there are some people that still have high activation levels. And those are the ones that we saw the D, it go down by um, after treatment. Again, we have, did, this is not multivariate analysis. It didn't look at viral load. It did, you know, didn't look at the A. I mean, there's quite a few until we do the multivariate models on a large number, we won't know for sure, but this gives us a hint that, yeah, there is something going on. If you treat someone with hep, hep, with co-infection and treat their HCV, you know, you may make a huge difference in the overall um, outcome of these women. Now, as I showed you, the fibrosis flattens out. This is a study Phyllis Tian and her group did. And, and so we think we need to follow for a longer period, and that is because of menopause and, and fatty liver disease and, you know, um, NASH and NAVL. So, so these are, it's very complex because there's a lot of things, a, a lot of things in play, and you've got to think about all of them, and you've got to tease it out. And then you got to really adjust for all the major factors. But for us, this is a clue. Something's going on. It does look like in, you know, whatever number of uh, half of the patients, activation did go down. There's a change in Tregs. And then we have all those. We do have data that um, uh, terminally differentiated RA positive also um, goes down. So the match it impacts maturation as well that it improves. So we, you know, it is a very complex study, and and it takes a lot. Of, it's a lot of work because you know you got to first do the flow, thirteen color flow on hundreds and hundreds of samples, and then you got to sort, you know, nine different samples, and then you got to evaluate how well you've done in terms of uh, extracting RNA. I mean it's. There's a lot involved in it, but we're to the point now where we are running these and 
and we're going to have some really good data in the next month or two. Yeah, yeah. I agree. Larger studies would be really helpful. Yeah. Jackie, I wanted to ask you, um, you and I also applaud you for incorporating the views of people, both clients and the people providing care to them in your testing. Uh, one of the people, one of the providers mentioned that you, people might not report positive results. And I can see that that might be a plus in some settings, but for some people, it might eliminate a barrier to testing because there are places in the world where uh, infection is tracked in ways that, pe that the that people who are infected find undesirable with public releasing of data on infection status, for example. So I can think that might be a plus in settings where people want to test but don't want for example, uh, you know, an outside group of people outside of their medical providers to know their status. What are yeah, thoughts? absolutely. And that data privacy is a, a big concern. Um, even in the technology design, we're looking at, oh, well, who does the interpretation? Because we have technology now, smartphones that can can interpret that line for you and tell you like that's positive or negative. Uh, and then what happens with that uh, who owns that information for those that are developing some of the more complex tests that integrate with EHRs uh, and electronic health systems. And so those aspects really inform um, the, the privacy and the safety of the individuals that are doing the tests. There's, there's convenience involved in having something that automatically sends information, but then there's a lot of things that can go wrong with that. Um, we've optimated, optim opted in this case for a, a lower tech option so that individuals could do it themselves. Um, but then there's also policy aspects of like, well, uh, is is this FDA approvable? I know the, the first HIV self-test that came out required someone to be on the phone with you, helping you to interpret the test. And um, because then you can, you can also manage that human connection, but then also there's an, a linkage to care and notification. Um, so yeah, it's it's interesting to see both the client perspectives that are valuing that privacy and the the providers' perspectives that are really thinking about, you know, how do you, how do we get them along the next steps? And um, balancing those is is definitely uh, a challenge for anybody that's thinking about how they might go about implementing um, and the safety of the individuals that are getting these results. Yeah, thank you, uh, Jackie. One a quick follow up question. This uh, test for acute infection is very important. We have lousy markers for acute infection at the moment for surveillance or for identifying uh, transmission networks and the like. That for um, that as um, and so I'm just curious, what's your next step in development? Do you have any um, uh, field trials um, underway or planned? That's the goal is to ultimately get it out and tested in the field. Right now, we're trying to figure out how we can scale up production. Um, the reason we made that little automated device is because we'd been it'd been grad students with tweezers assembling things, which is uh, <laughs> not how they want to spend their PhD. But but also there's there's quality control that we're trying to learn and figure out as we go. So uh, connecting with manufacturers that do this and uh, also being able to to get first usability studies because we don't want the test to fail because people didn't know how to use it right, and then. Um, out into really uh, doing those field trials. So yeah, okay. it's definitely in the plan. We want to get things out of the lab. They don't do much good sitting with me. Well, it's a very important area. Thank you very much. And thank you also, Andrea Kovacs, for uh, all the basic science research. I'll turn it over to Raul and Wilson to uh, say farewell. And again, all of this information be available on our website, globalhealth.org. And I think there may be an evaluation popping up here for you to... Uh, uh, fill out. Uh, Wilton, Raul. Well, thank you very much. Uh, clearly, uh, uh, you two are at the forefront and at the cutting edge of research, both in terms of device development and sort of product development that can really have an impact on population health. And certainly even in the questions that we got from the field asking us about, well, what about people that don't qualify for the new point of care a, a, a system out of Cepheid. Might there be room for other devices that can really help fill in some of those gaps? Of, cor of course there is. Um, the, the other uh, area is we're really keen to understand the, the impact on uh, uh, women's health. That's a major NIH priority right now. So Dr. Kovacs, congratulations on some very important work that will uh, really shed the light on, on, uh, on both care for HIV and HCV, 
but I think more generally around uh, a, an aging population that, that we need uh, to have much more research on. And with that- Thank you, Wilson. Wilson, I think me. that uh, you said everything. And uh, I thank uh, all the participants. Uh, I thank the organizers, uh, Dr. Ward, uh, and the panelists, that was a fantastic webinar, and uh, uh, hope we get uh, more questions and you will be able to to look at all this webinar online. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all.